Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is kind of just a, an introduction presentation, an int introductory presentation to kind of expose you all to what is physical medicine and rehab, what is pain management, what do we do. A lot of people don't even really know that this is a specialty in medicine. But um, honestly, the, the overall goal is to improve quality of life and function, um, and a part of that is reducing somebody's pain, which is why we, uh, we both did a fellowship in pain management on top of our training. Uh, so what is pain? Pain is a localized or generalized um, uh, unpleasant bodily sensation or complex sensations that cause mild to severe physical discomfort, but also emotional distress. And it usually results from a, some sort of bodily disorder, some sort of injury. Um, it can be influenced by biological, environmental, and psychological factors, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, just some quick statistics. 10% of the world's population suffers from chronic pain. And interestingly, in the US, actually 20% of the USA population suffers from chronic pain. That's about 50 million people, and that's actually a pretty conservative statistic. It's probably higher than that. Um, back pain is the second most common symptom. Um, that patients go and see their primary care doctor for. Pretty much everybody, most of us in this room, will experience back pain um, in some form or another at some point in our life. Uh, appropriate pain management requires a multidisciplinary approach, so um, that includes different kind of therapies that we'll kind of touch on in a little bit, different kind of medications, overall well-being, different kinds of vitamins and supplements, and holistic treatments. We'll kind of touch on these. Okay, so um, we'll kind of break up um, how we approach pain management. We can uh, approach it ph pharmaceutically, so with medications or non-pharmaceutically. Pharmaceutically being um, medications such as topical medications, different kinds of gels and creams, oral medications, which are pills or tablets we take by mouth, or actually injectable medications. Uh, Non-pharmaceutical um, approaches to pain include different procedures, um, that we'll talk about some, regener some regenerative medicine, uh, different kinds of therapies, supplements, holistic treatments, and overall wellness. So pharmaceutical treatments, uh, topical medications, um, we have anesthetics. I don't know if any of you have heard of lidocaine cream, lidocaine patches, you can get that over the counter. That is a common anesthetic topical medication. Um, it's pretty beneficial for for like skin pain or any kind of superficial or n not deep pain, so something that's close to the skin, so that cream or a topical can penetrate, you know, it doesn't penetrate very far, so maybe a centimeter or two. Um, different kind of NSAID creams, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory creams, um, like Voltaren gel, I'm sure some of you have heard of that, or it's also Diclofenac gel, Voltaren is the brand. Uh, that helps with uh, inflammation and helps decrease the inflammatory response. Again, we use this for more superficial types of pain, something closer to the skin, maybe neck pain or a joint pain. It's good for knee pain, things like that. Um, and we also prescribe compound creams. This is so the other two are over the counter. Actually, the Voltaren gel just became over the counter recently. Um, and the lidocaine cream is over the counter, but the compound creams are um, medical grade and those need a prescription. Uh, those can be a combination of things, a combination of neuropathic medication, uh, anesthetics, um, so like uh, nerve pain medication that's a controlled substance, they can actually compound that into a cream instead of taking it orally. Um, different kind of oral medications that we prescribe. Tylenol is the brand, common brand name that we use here in the U.S. Also, uh, acetaminophen is the actual drug name. Um, just some quick facts. I'm not actually giving any medical advice, but just some quick facts maybe to keep in mind. You don't really want to exceed three grams of Tylenol um, a day if you are taking it. Um, and you know the extra strength Tylenol tablets are 500 milligrams, or the regular Tylenol tablets are 350. So th something just to keep in mind if you are taking Tylenol. Um, and if you have any kind of liver disease or liver issues, you don't want to use Tylenol. In general, again, not offering medical advice. This is just a very general statement. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, those are things like naproxen, which is the brand name Aleve, ibuprofen, which is Motrin or Advil, or Celecoxib, which is uh, branded as Celebrex. Um, again, kind of a quick and fast rule. You don't want to use these if you have any kind of kidney disease or stomach ulcers. 
And then there's also nerve pain medications that we prescribe to help with not only nerve pain, so if you have like, you know, shooting pain coming from the neck into the arm or in the back going into the leg, but also for chronic pain. It um, doesn't have to be a pinched nerve. For chronic pain, we sometimes use this as well. Um, gabapentin is, uh, is the, the medication, also known as Neurontin. Pregabalin, also known as Lyrica. Um, even duloxetine, uh, which is Cymbalta. It's actually um, kind of more known as an antidepressant medication, but we do not use it for depression. It actually uh, does very well with nerve pain and chronic pain conditions. Um, and then uh, other types of medications that we use are injectables. So, yes? How about Ropinerol? Ropinerol? Uh, that's usually for restless leg syndrome. Uh, I've n I don't use it for pain. It can be, it can be for, for leg discomfort if you do have like a restless leg or leg cramping. Um, but I don't, I don't generally prescribe it for the majority of our pain conditions. That's very specific. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, injectable medications like epidurals or you know what most of us know to be as cortisone shots. Can I get a cortisone shot in the neck or a cortisone shot in the back? Um, we, uh, Sean and I, do those types of uh, procedures for radicular pain, sometimes back pain, shooting into the leg, neck pain, shooting into the arm, those kinds of things. Um, NSAIDs, you can also inject those, um, like Toradol injections, it can help with, uh, with pain overall. Um, hyaluronic acid is a gel injection that we use. It's a, it's a lubricant, basically when our joints over time with arthritis wear and tear, the, the fluid in our joints starts to decrease, especially in our knee, sometimes in our hip. Um, so this is like a, a synthetic form similar to the gel that our own body makes, but we start to lack that over time. Sometimes those gel injections can help with joint pain. So sometimes, I guess, once we've tried those cortisone gel injections, you know, conservative management, um, different procedures that we can do when other things fail are things like spinal cord stimulators. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of a spinal cord stimulator. Does anybody know what a spinal cord stimulator is? Yeah. So um, what that is is basically we, you know, we would take basically a small string and guide it up the, the back part of your back, you know, under X-ray, and that spinal cord stimulator um, gives like stimulation that you really most of the time can't feel, but that stimulation basically beats the pain signal. So if you're having pain in your back the stimulator will send signals faster than the pain signals from your joint or your back travels to kind of block out um, the pain signal. So that's an interesting, you know, an interesting um, uh, procedure that we do. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that you can try, I mean, at your doctor's discretion, you can try it out um, for five days. It's a relatively safe procedure if you get, you know, significant pain relief in the five days, then you proceed to an implant of the stimulator where basically instead of having the wire stick out of your back, they bury the wire with a generator kind of in the bottom of your, above your buttock area. Is that actually for spinal cord damage? It's for pain. It's not going to like regenerate your spinal cord or help fix anything. It's purely for pain management once everything is, has been exhausted. It's not, you know, it's not something we jump to. It'll be after everything else fails. Same thing with a perif peripheral nerve stimulator, same concept, but we can put it in different joints, different areas. If the knee is hurting, you can put a stimulator there. Um, uh, other things, uh, regenerative medicine, I don't know if anyone's heard of platelet-rich plasma. Uh, this is more of a regenerative medicine, which is thought to kind of fix some of our you know, tendons or our joints where we take our own blood or the patient's own blood and we spin it and then we just take the, the, the PRP part, is, which is the part that has all the healing compounds of our body and then we would inject the patient's own healing, um, part of the healing part of the blood into a tendon, for example, if there's a tear or um, another painful area. Do insurance generally cover that? No. Yeah, that some, some are starting to cover parts of it. That's good to know. Mostly for joints. Uh, nothing really in the spine yet. 
but some are starting to cover it for joints. Okay, partially. Yeah. Most is still considered experimental, but some we've done for patients recently, we've sent a claim to the insurance and surprisingly we've gotten back actually um, some, some from the insurance company. And um, stem cells, that's another, um, I don't personally do them, Sean has done them before, um, but that's another kind of treatment that, that is offered um, from some providers. Um, and therapies, um, physical, occupational therapy, very important at least to kind of develop a good home exercise program. Um, make sure you're doing your exercises appropriately because um, we know we can cause damage if we're doing exercise but we're doing it the wrong way. We can be, you know, causing harm sometimes. So it's good to develop a home exercise program. Um, mental health, we know that that contributes significantly to pain. Um, different supplements. THC, CBD, those creams are becoming more popular. There's, you know, various conflicting information about how effective it is. Um, different vitamins, antioxidants, minerals. A holistic approach to, to pain, there's acupuncture care, um, chiropractic care, massage, osteopathic manipulative medicine, OMM, which some DO doctors perform. So if you ever see the, the letters DO behind somebody's name, they have at least been trained in OMM. Some practice, some don't. Um, nutrition, uh, sleep hygiene, very important. Exercising uh, consistently, very important. Uh, meditation can also be very helpful. So that was really it, kind of uh, through a lot of information kind of quickly if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, um, this is, yeah. So, you know, as, as pain doctors, um, but our initial, our residency, our training was in physical medicine and rehab. Our ultimate goal is to improve someone's daily function. So regardless of what their diagnosis is, what their difficulties are. Our goal is to improve those challenges to allow them to function independently as possible. So with a lot of this stuff, Rachel went over, uh, interventional procedures, medications. Yeah, obviously the goal is to improve someone's pain, but ultimately the goal is to improve their pain so they can function better. So we can see the same problem come into our office. Call it back pain, it's the most common thing we see, but everyone's, treatment plan is going to be very different based on what they've done before, what their examination is, what their imaging shows. So we have this, the, these multiple options that we have to treat patients, but the most important thing we always do first is try to figure out where that person's pain is coming from. So it's the patient's history, it's the physical examination we do in the office, it's any imaging or testing we get to try to further decide what the diagnosis is, is the best way for us to develop the best treatment plan we can for that individual patient. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's someone right behind you. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, in the back, yeah. Um, can you tell us the difference for So, it's, so the question was, who should someone see that has back pain? Where should they go first? For some insurances, you're required to see your primary care doctor to get referred to a specialist. Uh, Blue Care Network is probably the most common one where you have to do that. Um, ultimately, I think, I'm, I'm obviously biased because I'm a physical medicine and rehab doctor, but I think we do the best from a diagnostic standpoint. And if we feel like you know chiropractic care could be effective, we feel like you have to see a surgeon, we would refer you there. But I think from a diagnostic standpoint, someone in our field would be the best suited to figure out um, a treatment plan. You know, if you, for someone that has pain, the last resort is to do surgery. There are reasons to do more emergent or urgent surgeries, but I think, you know, for the, for the standard patient, you want to exhaust all your conservative options first before undergoing something more invasive. So, you know, the question was about the spinal cord stimulator that Rachel was talking about. It's not something we use first line. It's something that you're implanting in somebody's body, you know? So we try to do everything conservative first, and if those things don't work, 
Then we look at the more invasive options. Did you want to add to that? Perfect. Go ahead. I have a question. I've never heard about the gel that you mentioned. Uh, is that appropriate for hands? It's only approved for knees. Uh, only approved for knees. I've done it in hips, I've done it in shoulders. Um, sometimes we get samples from the, the companies that make it. Um, they're doing studies in the hips and shoulders. Those are probably the next joints that will be approved. But I think they've been saying that for like years and it hasn't. Um, so, but it's only approved for knees. Yeah. So a specific, when you say spine doctor, I assume orthopedic spine surgeon or neurosurgeon, they're more surgically trained. So they're the ones that will cut, open you up, take out disc, remove bone around nerve, put hardware in. They're trained from a surgical standpoint. As physical medicine and rehab doctors, our training was really clinical, not in the operating room. More from a, a diagnostic standpoint, an examination standpoint, you know, we utilize imaging as a guide, whereas a surgeon's gonna use that imaging to guide them to do surgery, we're utilizing it for other sorts of treatments. And they don't do like the epidurals and stuff. Yeah, and, and most of them don't do like spinal injections, epidurals like Rachel talked about. If you can't take anti-inflammatories, what can you take besides spinal? For what? Pain. Just generalized pain? So the neuropathic medications that Rachel mentioned, specifically Lyrica or Pregabalin, Gabapentin or Neurontin, Cymbalta or Duloxetine, and other medications in that class um, could be effective based on, again, what you're treating. But there are a lot of options outside of non steroidal anti-inflammatories that can be very effective. I, even if someone doesn't have a reason to avoid them, I try to avoid them personally because I know the side effects they can cause. Of non steroidals. Of non, yeah, non steroidal. The reason I ask yeah. is uh, Johnson and Johnson treated heart stents. Once you've had those, you can't take any anti Correct. What, what I know Rachel mentioned the, the kidney issues, potentially the stomach issues. It also is known to cause acceleration of coronary artery disease. Um, so people that do have known cardiac risk factors, it's definitely a reason to avoid them. So for rheumatoid arthritis specifically, some of these treatments are very effective. In addition to what we do, rheumatoid arthritis is inflammatory arthritis. So when we talk about arthritis, the main two are basically osteoarthritis or wear and tear of the joints, and an inflammatory arthritis, which pseudogout would actually fall under too, which is inflammation of a joint, really without the wear and tear component. Uh, you can be diagnosed with these conditions in your teens, you know, up to your 70s, 80s. Um, a rheumatologist should be involved in the care of that patient. There are medications they can prescribe to decrease how much inflammation is occurring in the body. But in, with, with, with them, we can provide assistance as well. We see a lot of patients that have autoimmune conditions, like rheumatoid arthritis, that we aid in their care uh, with the rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. What about the sciatica nerve? So this sciatica, like yeah. the term, means like a pinched nerve. Normally we think of the low back into a leg. It can also happen into the neck, into an arm, or the mid back around the belly. Um, the sciatica nerve is actually a nerve in our butts, but sciatica means a pinched nerve in the lumbar spine, which is the low back. So a lot of the things that we do, medications, physical therapy, and injections, can be very effective for that problem before you may need surgery or not need surgery. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you treat uh, degenerative disc pain? Yes, you can. Uh, it's a difficult diagnosis to treat because it's based on where the where the issue lies. But certain in certain medications, certain forms of physical therapy, and certain injections can be helpful. You're not going to change the degenerative disc, but you can change the uh, the pain associated with it. Following up on sciatica, I find that problem when I take long car trips. Is there any medication that's out there that I could take that would help with that 
what would be bad for my driving and paying attention kind of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, some of the side, some of the medications we prescribe definitely cause sedation, um, fatigue. The answer is maybe. You know, you'd want to make sure obviously you tolerate a medication first before you go and do something like that long, you know, for a long period of time. But yeah, I mean, these, some of these nerve pain medications, although they're primarily prescribed daily because they need to really work up a certain amount in your body to be effective. I do have some patients that take them as needed if they know that they're going to do an activity that's going to cause their, their pain to occur. Um, the other things are anti-inflammatories can sometimes work as well in those situations. How effective is a chiropractor? I, I think it depends on what you're treating and who you're seeing. You know, I think that in any area of medicine and healthcare, there are good providers and, and not good providers. And I think good chiropractors can be very effective, you know, for patients. Um, you know, is it a one-stop shop? No, we're not a one-stop shop. You know, we refer patients all the time to other, other types of physicians, other types of uh, uh, medical practitioners like chiropractors. I think they can be very helpful with certain conditions. Yeah. If you've got like, <clears throat> Degenerative disc disease or arthritis, and the pain or the ache is just livable with, it doesn't overly bother you. Are you doing more harm by not getting any treatment, or just leave the state of quo? If the pain is not limiting your function, right. you are doing no harm by not getting treatment. You know, the only time I, again, you know, we see patients, and they come in with a complaint, and they're like, well, it's not really impacting me. Like, do I need to do anything about it? Well, no, you don't. You know, if the symptoms get worse, the answer is yes. There's no reason just to, none of these medications are going to help prevent the, the degradation or worsening of the condition. What's going to improve it is going to be your activity. Well, your body doesn't sort of adapt so, an extreme example, you start walking with a limp or something like that, that you need to worry too much about? As long as you continue maintaining your normal activity, the activity you need to do, the activity you want to do, no, I mean if therapy. something like that happens, you can we can do something about it, especially with therapy to work on the mechanics. But you don't need to do that like preventatively. Do you do epidurals in your practice, or do anesthesiologists do that? We do that. Yeah. So the the way so through our residency in physical medicine and rehab, we both work with physicians that did do epidurals. I didn't get trained in residency. I don't know if you. Uh, I did. Yeah, one more. Okay. We we had a, we both did fellowship for over a year, specifically trained to learn how to do epidurals. Along the lines of what he had just asked about um, potentially causing like, you know, more damage by not getting treated, my doctor had said that for sciatica, if you don't treat it, it could become permanent damage or something like that. It could somehow damage my nerve or something. So with, with sciatica, Again, a, a damage or an irritation to a nerve. There are different levels of severity. Some just cause irritation, where you can feel like some numbness, tingling in a certain distribution of an arm or leg or like your abdomen. It can cause pain. It can also cause weakness. When it gets to that point where it causes weakness, if you don't get it treated appropriately, yes, that weakness can become permanent. But just because you have some symptoms of the more mild cases does not mean it's gonna get there. So it's really, you know, patient to patient basis. And that's why I think our training comes in very handy. We're not treating the picture. We're treating you, your story, your exam, and the picture. So we're taking it all together uh, to make sure that we're providing the best treatment plan or options for the individual patient. Do you want to tell them about EMG or is that too much? Yeah. Do you do um, therapy, the physical therapy there or do you Each of our offices have physical therapists, which I think is very valuable because we're there and communicate with the physical therapist very easily about how someone's doing and progressing. We can also see you in the office at the same time. Um, but there are cases where we absolutely refer out. Patients had good experience with another physical therapist before. They need a certain modality or treatment option that we don't offer. We work with physical therapists all over. What about numbness? Like in the feet or toes or things like that? How do you treat that? So it depends what the numbness is coming from. The most common reason to have numbness in the feet would be like a neuropathy. And the most common reasons for neuropathy in America are diabetes, 
uh, alcohol abuse, and vitamin deficiencies. And what we do is we, with an exam, with appropriate blood work, with a test called the EMG, which is a nerve test that we do in the office, look for nerve damage, we can try to figure out where the source is, and if we can figure out what the cause of it is, we can figure out a good treatment option. Sometimes you can't figure out the cause, and the medications like Lyrica, like Gabapentin, like Cymbalta for nerve symptoms can be very effective. Another procedure we do in the office is called Cutenza, which is specifically for neuropathy from diabetes. It's capsaicin, which is an over-the-counter cream at a very low dose. Um, we have, a, we have these pads that we put on the skin of the feet that someone comes to the office for at a very high dose of capsaicin, uh, and it's supposed to decrease how sensitive those nerves are on the feet to decrease somebody's symptoms. So there are a lot of options for things like that. Are there any options for um, uh, muscle cramps, leg cramps, foot cramps, things like that? Do you treat that? We do, and again, the question is, what is the underlying cause? A lot of times when we deal with cramping, are there issues with someone's electrolytes, their sodium, their potassium, their magnesium, their calcium? So we want to make sure from a, uh, a medical standpoint everything is, is cleared and we can't find a reason for it, then we can definitely, there's medication we can use to absolutely improve those symptoms. Any possibility of your combination of different drugs causing some of your problems? Every medication you prescribe can definitely have side effects. We always try to avoid provide, giving people medications that can have, that counteract each other, that can cause an increase in side effects. But sure, we're always looking out to make sure that, are they effective? Are they causing side effects? What can we do to change that? You know, we, we make sure we follow up with our patients regularly to try to avoid those situations from occurring. For someone with neck pain, how do you determine the cause of it? What tests would need to be run? If you assume it's an if someone comes in just with neck pain, a physical exam would do us very, very well. Check strength, check sensation, check reflexes, check range of motion. When it comes down to it with the neck specifically, we're looking at is it a mechanical source, muscle, tendon, ligament, joint, or is it a neurological source, a disc in your neck, a nerve being pinched, and a physical exam can a lot of times give us that information. From there, we may not need more imaging. We just need to treat the, the reason for the pain. Yeah? Do you treat headaches or migraines? Yes. We, we, we do have some options that we use to treat migraines. There are times where you know, we're limited and we send out to a neurologist for further management, but absolutely, we do treat it. So I've had osteoarthritis that continues to get worse and worse in my hands specifically. Um, been to the general practitioner and been forced them to take the test for rheumatoid arthritis and that because it's all negative. Um, and so recently I got referred to get some x-rays and they've referred me to a hand surgeon. So I'm listening to you here kind of feeling like maybe we skipped over some steps, but I don't know. It's, they're, they're saying there's no cure, there's nothing you can do for, and I mean, I'm starting to get the formation of the fingers, I can't close my fist all the way. Now I'm starting to get it, you know, really in the thumb, which is where it's, all right, I said, I'll, let's get some x-rays and figure out what to do. So, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, you know, we see this a lot actually. Like, you know, Rachel said, our field is kind of small in relation to a lot of other fields of medicine. Yes, there are a lot of times where patients go see a surgeon and have surgery and they probably didn't need it. You know, that's not all the case, but it definitely happens. Um, for someone like you who has joint pain in all their joints in their fingers, what's a surgeon gonna do? You know, he's not gonna replace all your joints in your fingers, right? I mean, they, they do do joint replacements for like individual joints that are issues but they're not gonna go in and remove, do them all, right? So are there stuff that we can do to help, or to help reduce your risk of needing surgery for certain joints? The answer is yes. When someone does a rheumatologic screen, it's normally a, a set of blood work, but that's not it. There's more testing you can do to make sure it's not 
and inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And we, we do all that. Just curious, have you read anything up on uh, something they call the spinal cord uh, injuries, uh, dancing molecules? Dancing molecules? Yeah. No. Professor, do you have read anything on Dancing? Do you, do you can you explain it further? Professor out of Northwestern about two years ago, I guess, and I think what dancing molecules is a triggering mechanism for a spinal cord well, to tell the brain, heal me. Um, it, there's a professor at Northwestern uh, University, and it's the last name starts with an AS. Sharma or uh, Shore, I, I don't remember exactly, but this has been going on for two or three years. And I know they're talking about going to the FDA with it. So, is it an, do you know if it's an injection? Yeah, a single injection. They've actually taken mice that were paralyzed um, with back legs, gave it an injection in about two weeks' time and started walking. Was it, was it stem cells? No, it's not stem cell. It's just a molecule they developed? So, right. It's some kind of a truth mechanism for a spinal cord repair. Hmm. I'll look into it. Never heard of it. Google it and it's right there. Nanofibers. From what? The molecules form nanofibers that dance around making communication with cells to repair the injured spinal cord more likely. Yeah, I mean, this stuff's fascinating. Um, yeah. it's, it's good, right? Like, we're, we're always open to learning new techniques and new treatment options for, for patients. Um, so, you know, one-off cases, um, you know, are intriguing to us. The pain injections, um, how easy is it to become uh, dependent on them? Dependent on the pain injections? It's not. It's not easy at all. Um, you know, when we do injections, so the general injections we do are normally steroid injections. We're very conservative with how much steroid we use. Too much steroids can cause issues like osteoporosis. They can lead to diabetes or worsening blood sugar for someone that's already diabetic. They can decrease our immune system. Patients that find value in them, they may get three or four a year, but I wouldn't necessarily that cause them to be dependent on it. They see the value in it. We, we only do them when we think it's appropriate and when the patient obviously believes it would be helpful or has been helpful in the past. It's not a medication where people build like a tolerance to or have withdrawals from like some medications that we can prescribe or people actually get like a physical dependence on it. I'll talk to you later. Yep. On that same subject, would, would, would steroids be appropriate for osteoarthritis? Steroids can be appropriate for osteoarthritis in any joint. We just limit how much we use. Yes. Are you familiar with uh, patients receiving steroid injections and then getting the hiccups for days? I've seen it. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very uncommon thing. I, a few of my patients have I've had that, actually. Is it, is it an allergy? No, it's just like a, it's a uh, side effect of the medication. So if you were going to be a patient, would you alert your physician, please do not give me steroids? That is definitely something you should say. <laughs> yeah, or you know, you can try to decrease the dose, right? There's a ways of maybe to round it to limit that. Um, the most, again, the most common side effects we, we deal with with like, I mentioned like long-term use of steroids or too much steroid, but the initial doses of steroid, we can see flushing, we can see elevations in heart rate, insomnia, elevations in blood pressure, um, hiccups aren't common. I don't believe safely. We do use ultrasound for other injections that we do, a lot of joints, um, some nerve. When we deal with the spine, we really want to be very sensitive to the, the structures around it. So um, I would not be comfortable doing it without an x ray machine. And how much radiation does it It's very low dose. We use a special x ray machine called a fluoroscopic uh, device, um, it's very low dose radiation. Thank you.
what's a, what's a, if somebody calls and says, I want to become a patient or I'd like to see you, what does the first visit look like for somebody, the general person? The, the first visit, we, we talk about why they're there, right? what the chief complaint is. We go through the history of that complaint. How did it start? How long have you had it for? Describe the type of pain for me. Any other symptoms? Um, and then we go through a physical examination, more focused on the, what the complaint is, but sometimes it's more of a generalized examination, uh, neuromuscular examination, looking at, again, strength, reflexes, sensation, range of motion. Um, I work on my differential based on what the patient's complaint is, based on their history, based on my exam. If anyone has a history of any sort of imaging done on that area, I always look at that after I've examined the patient, after I've talked to the patient, because again, we're not utilizing the image as the answer. We're using it as a guide or a piece to the whole puzzle. So we go through everything. At the end of that visit, we talk about what I think it could be. Here are treatment options. Here's testing that we can or cannot do. And I always really leave it up to the patient as to what they want to do. I, I know I'm the physician and I have the expertise in how to treat it, but what's most important for me is the patient's comfortable with that treatment plan. So we'll go through that together. And then at, the, at the end, decide together what that plan is going to be and what the follow-up from there would look like. For us, yeah, so I, I, I did a DO medical school. Rachel did an MD medical school. I did a, so in medical school, I learned the osteopathic manual medicine that Rachel talked about in the lecture. I don't do it, right? It's not something I focused on after medical school. I didn't do it in residency. I haven't done it as an attending. Um, so I did an MD residency like Rachel did. So, you know, historically, DOs and MDs practice very differently. In our generation, they practice similarly. We're taught more pharmaceutical techniques in medical school. They're taught more holistic techniques in medical school. I think a combination of, the, of both is what's the most beneficial for the patient. And, and now, MD and DO programs are combined. There's no different residencies anymore. They're, they're together, and they should be. What was the treatment that you said that she could do that you were trained in? The, the osteopathic manual medicine is something I was trained in in medical school. I do not use, utilize it in practice. I have other DOs that I send out for that specifically. Jorgens, yeah. sounds like you, Jor, Jorgens disease or? or Sjogren's? Yeah. yeah. Explain that. Yeah, so it's another autoimmune condition like the rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of times it's associated with like dry mouth, dry eyes. Um, something we actually don't really treat because a lot of times it doesn't really have musculoskeletal issues, it can, but more common for just a rheumatolo rheumatologist to treat with different sorts of medications. Any other questions? Yeah. Right? yeah. I was recently diagnosed with arthritis in several areas of my spine. I also have MS, so if I were to come to you and, and uh, the hip doctor did, that did the MRI suggested that interventional pain medicine um, so I'm kind of searching for something that right now. Um, do I have to involve my neurologist at all? Um, you? No, I mean, we, we have patients with all, like, all different diagnoses. I have a lot of patients that have MS. When it comes to our treatment options, like I know with MS, depending on what type of MS someone has, they get steroids if they have exacerbations. So I know that, well, I need to probably be more conservative in the amount of steroid I use, because they're not just getting it from me, they're gonna get it from other sources or are gonna get it from other sources. So it's part of the whole picture of the patient. But what I do would have no impact on somebody's MS or other conditions they may have, and if it does or could, I always reach out to that other doctor just to make sure what I'm doing is appropriate for them. Because some of my spine problems could be MS as well, right? A lot of times MS doesn't cause pain. Yeah. It can cause weakness, but some spine problems can cause, outside of MS can cause no pain and just cause weakness. So that's where like a test, like an EMG, a nerve test, can try to differentiate between the two. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, deal with like, 
weakness? Yes. Anything else? All right, well, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Good questions. Thank you.